Hello, I'm Llewellyn King, the host of MECFS Alert. I'm delighted today to have as my guest on the program, Dr. Ovid Amatai, who is the president of Solve ME. Uh, welcome to the broadcast, Ovid. Uh, Thank you. How are things going at Solve ME? Thank you for having me, uh, Lorna. It's great to uh, to be with you again uh, uh, today. And uh, this has been a uh, this has been a hectic time uh, for our community. Um, and frankly, I feel for uh, for everyone uh, everyone around us. We uh, we were hoping that uh, we're going to continue to see the uh, the decline in uh, in new COVID uh, cases, but unfortunately, uh, we now have. Uh, uh, this uh, sur a surge with the uh, the Delta variant. I, I apologize. I have a scratch on my nose because uh, I'm wearing uh, the mask uh, all the time again. So uh, I, I apologize for that. But that's really that has become part of life. And of course, uh, we talked about it last time. We were very concerned about the uh, the emerging uh, data that uh, some people who uh, uh, were infected with COVID actually uh, do not recover in the time that you expect them to uh, to recover. And they um, uh, they really begin to uh, to have the symptoms that are unfortunately so familiar to us uh, in the ME community and uh, primarily the uh, the post exertion malaise, which is uh, obviously the uh, the hallmark of, of of ME. So it's been a busy time and uh, and really a, source, a sense of urgency for us to uh, to make progress in understanding these diseases. It's a hugely uh, significant thing if long haul COVID is in fact ME or so closely mimics ME that it might as well be, because an awful lot of people are in for a terrible time, uh, ME being such a dreadful, long haul, debilitating, uh, awful disease. Uh, do you think that the medical community understands what is happening if in fact ME is or mimics uh, long haul, or long haul COVID is or mimics? Uh, yeah, yeah. It's it's. I, I think you're, you're you're exactly right. We begin to see the uh, the shift from looking at the acute disease and really uh, for the medical community to understand that there is this other aspect of COVID, which is really the long term uh, outcome of, of of the disease. I think I think what's what's happening right now is that we started to use the term uh, long haulers for the people who are affected by that or long COVID. And right now it's in sort of a, an umbrella term. Uh, in other words, it captures um, people who had COVID, um, were severely affected, uh, were at the ICU. And of course that takes time to, uh, to recover from that. And there is a lot of um, organ damage that COVID can, uh, uh, can lead to. So we see the, uh, the heart, uh, the damage to the heart, to the kidneys, to the lungs. But that is, in many ways, that's that's very different from what we would call the uh, the ME part um, of uh, of the disease. Um, that really has to do with uh, with changes uh, that are primarily uh, immune and uh, neurologically mediated. Uh, so it's the, uh, the 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 fatigue, the extreme fatigue. It's the uh, the brain fog that um, is so familiar to uh, to people within uh, within our community. And that's what we begin to see now. And in fact, the three symptoms that people who, um, who continue to struggle after they had COVID, the three symptoms that they, um, that they cite the most are fatigue, post-exertional malaise, and cognitive dysfunction. So from that perspective, you're right. It, it is very similar to, uh, to what we know. But at the same time, the other symptoms that are quite unique to COVID, for instance, the loss of, of uh, uh, smell um, uh, or taste, which is, which is obviously unique, and this is not something that we have seen in the past uh, in, in our community. So I think we're learning a lot, of, a lot about that. And, um, and of course, uh, I think that the, the, medical, uh, the medical community begins to, to pay attention because the numbers, unfortunately, just continue to, uh, to be so high of people who get infected and, and, uh, and people who, uh, who do not recover. What is, the, uh, what is the thrust of the research that you support? Which is your primary function is to support research, I believe. That, yeah, that's uh, th that's exactly right. And 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 eventually, you know, everything has to come down to research uh, that enables us to uh, to find better diagnostics and treatments for for this disease. So that's uh, that's our focus. We do that 
um, but you know, in two ways. One is to uh, to continue to advocate for for more funding uh, to come from the government, the federal government, to support research. And uh, and actually, one of the things that uh, happened just recently, and you know, to connect that to our uh, a previous uh, previous topic, uh, we've been very active uh, at the end of of last year of 2020. Uh, advocating for Congress to appropriate money to study long COVID. And uh, that was very successful. Congress uh, directed uh, $1.15 billion to the NIH to study long COVID. And of course, uh, um, our hope and our, um, uh, our thinking is that um, understanding long COVID and post-infectious diseases would really help us understand um, other diseases um, uh, such as uh, uh, ME. And so uh, just in the middle of September, uh, there was this important announcement from the NIH that uh, the funding uh, that was given by Congress is now uh, starts to, uh, to flow into the, uh, the research community. Um, about $470 million were finally uh, awarded um, through uh, uh, NYU and uh, other, um, uh, other research sites around the country uh, to really start this large effort to understand long COVID. So we're very, uh, um, you know, we're ha happy to see that uh, this, uh, this research uh, is now initiated. But of course, as advocates, we, uh, uh, we continue to be impatient with, uh, with the government. We want this to be faster. We understand the need to, to do this thoroughly, um, but our role will be to continue to, uh, uh, to urge uh, the scientific community to, uh, uh, to move as, as quickly as possible. When I talk to patients, ME patients, um, they're very frustrated by the slow process. They read on Cochure and other, other scientific uh, uh, databases uh, of all sorts of research that's going on and little discoveries when they say, but it's not helping me. Uh, when is something going to happen which will help me? And uh, do you think that that is likely to be discovered or have you discovered anything that just helps a patient get through the door day? Uh, I get all of these horrific emails, people hoping to die, people not wanting to wake up in the morning because it is so awful to endure decade in, decade out in me. Yeah, so I think that there are now, uh, uh, again, the, uh, the, the COVID situation, um, um, you know, the, uh, the silver lining, if there is one to this uh, tra tragic pandemic, is that there is now much more attention uh, being, uh, being given to, uh, to what we've learned so far in ME. And there are treatments that at least for some people are, um, are very helpful. They have not been studied properly. So that is a source of frustration to, uh, to the scientific Would community. Would you like to enumerate some of those treatments or therapies? Yeah, I, I'll mention maybe, uh, maybe a couple of those that, uh, uh, that, we, uh, that we're learning about. There was a recent publication that described the experience uh, with a drug that has been uh, in use for about 20 years. It's a drug uh, that's called the Bilify. Um, or uh, uh, the uh, its scientific name is uh, aripiprazole, uh, which is a drug that has been used for a number of, uh, of different um, uh, uh, different conditions. Um, but it, it turns out that at a very low dose, which is much lower uh, than the dose that's uh, typically used in uh, for those other um, other uh, indications, uh, that drug seem to uh, to provide um, help in terms of uh, improving the, cogn the cognitive function uh, for people with ME. So it is probably working in a different way, uh, not uh, the way that it works uh, uh, for, uh, for other situations, but that drug, uh, uh, based on what was published, again, not, in, not in, the, uh, in the most rigorous studies, but sufficient evidence to say there's something here for, uh, uh, that works for some people. So that's, uh, that's one drug which again is, uh, um, ha has a lot of information about its safety. So it's something that uh, with the, uh, um, the right uh, supervision from, uh, from an experienced uh, healthcare provider, this is something that uh, uh, people can discuss with their, um, um, uh, with their physician. And uh, so I think that now with COVID, this would be an opportunity to try, uh, since we have uh, the large number of, of people who are now facing uh, those same challenges, 
this may be the time to, to actually study a drug uh, like Abilify um, in the right way, and then we will know um, um, what does it do and, uh, and who are the patients who benefit from that. So that's, uh, that's one drug. Uh, that uh, that actually has been um, has what been was shown. Uh, let me interrupt. I'm sorry. What yeah. was it originally developed for? So it was originally uh, developed for uh, for a number of uh, of mental health conditions, and it's used. Um, uh, um, uh, in, in, in a number of, uh, of those disorders, uh, but it's a different dose. So uh, really, uh, uh, the doses that we're talking about for most people would be, you know, a fifth or maybe even less than that of the, of the dose that's used for, for other conditions. So uh, it is uh, probably working through the ne uh, neurological part, uh, so really working on the, um, on the neurological uh, side of things, uh, but potentially may have other um, uh, other benefits as well. So another drug that I'll mention is naltrexone, and naltrexone has been uh, very much in the news because it's used as a as a drug to rescue from overdose of opioids. Uh, but again, used at, a, at at much lower doses than it's used for uh, for that purpose. Uh, again, it seems to uh, to benefit people with uh, with ME. So um, one of the things that uh, we would like as a community to see uh, at this point is uh, for, for those kind of drugs that are available, uh, they are approved by the FDA, again, for other, um, other situations, other conditions, uh, but could really provide a lot of, a lot of benefit uh, if we really understand um, exactly how to use them and what, you know, what, uh, what uh, patients would actually benefit from using that. So I'm, I'm very hopeful. That again, with uh, with the kind of resources and the kind of attention that, that is now given uh, uh, to um, uh, to these challenges, that we'll see uh, um, more of the kind of studies that will tell us more about that. So, and when of course, I, when uh, I started when I started covering ME as a subject, uh, amplogen was a very hot topic, and a lot of people got a lot of yeah. help from it. But it's very hard to get. I think there's only one clinic now. Uh, authorized to uh, yeah. administer it. It's an infusion. It takes time. It takes a setup. You can't get a pill and swallow it. But uh, I know at least six people who absolutely assured me that they had been helped enormously with Amplogen. Right. But it so, so seems to have gotten the recognition or the support it needs, and it failed to get FDA uh, approval. Right, and that, that was years ago, and actually, again, it's very interesting, and, and it's, it's timely that you mentioned that uh, there was just a, an announcement uh, from the company that makes Amplogen that they are about to start a study in long COVID. Um, and it's really about those cognitive aspects of, of long COVID, which are very similar to, uh, to ME, and uh, it's exactly this intersection that, that we're talking about now that I think really has the, the chance uh, to benefit both communities. So the first study will be in long COVID, uh, but again, they will basically test the same uh, effect that was observed before uh, in ME. So hopefully those studies will be conducted in the right way. And uh, unfortunately there are uh, patients with long COVID who'd be, uh, who'd be enrolled into those studies uh, probably quite, uh, quite quickly. So that's something that uh, we're very much uh, interest to, uh, interested to, to follow over the next uh, few months. Um, and we also hear from, from the company that uh, uh, given that uh, they're now um, uh, able to, to test uh, amplogen in long COVID, they plan to, to do the same um, uh, for ME. So again, I think that there's, uh, there's definitely a, um, a momentum right now and uh, long COVID does give, uh, give us the, uh, the opportunity to, uh, to make breakthroughs for uh, both communities, both the ME community as well as the, uh, the long COVID community. The government, I think, in, in September finally uh, said how it would spend or how it was allocating the $1.15 billion approved by Congress for long-haul COVID, but which includes ME funding. Um, is that going to affect things? When will we see that having an effect in the daily publication yeah. of newspapers? Uh, so we're 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 watching this very very carefully. This is uh, this is really the opportunity to to make those breakthroughs um, at the time that we need them to to happen. Um, so about half of the uh, um, the money that was allocated by Congress to the NIH last year is now uh, it now begins to flow to the researchers that uh, that are, are going to do the studies. Um, we would like this to happen sooner. 
we would like to see things move much faster, but uh, we understand that's, uh, um, you know, sometimes uh, a progress uh, does take time. Um, I would I would hope to see some of the data begin to uh, to come out uh, next year. Um, that's really uh, going to be uh, uh, still important to do that as we continue to see the number of people get infected. Uh, that would still be helpful to to have that. Um, what we want to see, and uh, it's not exactly clear yet how that's going to happen, um, how those studies will compare um, uh, long COVID with uh, with other uh, relevant populations such as people with ME people with this autonomia, and we want to make sure that uh, the knowledge that has been gained over the past uh, 20 or 30 years is not going to be uh, lost because of uh, because it really could have a lot of impact on understanding lung COVID. So we're going to continue to be the voice uh, to bridge between the existing knowledge and um, and the new frontiers that we need to, um, uh, to, to, to get to and, and really have breakthroughs uh, to, uh, to understand those diseases. Over one of the goals, not a cure, but a goal, which would be very important because it would increase the ability of untrained physicians to diagnose um, their patients, is uh, some sort of biological markup. And I've been reading that there's progress in using um, saliva, spittle, if you will. Um, how's that coming? And is that on the horizon? Because if you can get that, suddenly all of these general practitioners who are just dumbfounded and don't know what is wrong with their patients and who don't wish to invest the time for a wastebasket analysis of going through all the things it's not, uh, can really be a lot more helpful to their patients. Yes, that, that's, that's probably the, the greatest need for, uh, for ME is to have a simple, accessible uh, diagnostic. So we're involved in a study um, that I find to be very interesting. Really, the origin of, of this study um, are in, uh, in research that was done for the military uh, to look at um, uh, markers, uh, uh, specific peptides in the saliva that would be indicative of, uh, of level of fatigue. And uh, that research was extended to, uh, to look at uh, myalgic cephalomyelitis. And uh, some preliminary data suggests that uh, there are some markers that could help us um, diagnose or at least uh, are correlated uh, with, uh, with the disease. So we're involved in that study. Uh, the collection of the samples um, and the study uh, cohort is actually through our You and Me registry, uh, which again is, uh, is a platform that, uh, that was built. Um, and supported by SOLVE ME uh, to enable research to do exactly these kind of studies um, where we can uh, directly collect samples from, uh, from people affected by ME. And, uh, and I think we're, uh, we're very eager to see what the results are. We don't, uh, the, uh, this is just the beginning of the, of the study, so we don't have the results yet, uh, but we are very, uh, very eager to, uh, to see what, uh, what the findings are. What are, you, what are you looking for in the saliva? That yeah, so, so the, saliva, the saliva is actually, a, uh, in many ways, a reflection of our metabolic state. You know, think about it, you know, our, we salivate when we are hungry. Um, and so there's a lot of connection, and the saliva really reflects the metabolic state, uh, and also uh, the certain uh, what's going on in our, in our gut. Uh, as it relates to uh, uh, to the microbiome, those bacteria that, that that live in our gut. So the saliva is very sensitive, as it turns out, to, to those changes, and that's really what we're looking to see. There are some peptides; uh, these are small uh, small molecules um, that uh, uh, really, uh, um, you know, if that study uh, uh, continues to uh, to uh, to show uh, the results that we've seen so far, uh, there may be uh, some ways to uh, to look at uh, at some of those markers and tell. Um, the difference between people who are affected by, by ME and people um, uh, who are not. So that's what we, uh, what, what we hope to see here. What would you like to say to the cohort, to the community, to the sick? What would your message to them to be? Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, um, I, I think what, uh, what I feel right now is, uh, you know, we, we are in the midst of a pandemic, uh, which uh, uh, has been tragic. Um, but I, I, I have become more hopeful. Uh, I've seen how uh, science could actually be applied uh, in a very, very uh, a quick way. We generated vaccines that are now saving lives, um, perhaps not as many as we would like, but, uh, but we do have this gift, this unbelievable gift from science to, uh, you know, to humanity uh, in the form of vaccines. 
And so that gives me a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of hope that, that we can see progress that can be uh, directly applied to uh, not only save lives, uh, but also uh, improve the, uh, the quality of lives so people are already affected by, by many diseases. So um, I, I feel hopeful. Um, and I would say, you know, ca cautiously optimistic that uh, what we can learn from long COVID and what we've learned so far in ME could really converge and lead to, um, uh, first of all, diagnostics and then ultimately treatments and, and maybe even cures uh, for this disease. So um, I, I think there is a message of hope. I have the same feeling that science has uh, been unleashed in a way it wasn't heretofore uh, on ME and that Therefore, we can hope for a resolution. Uh, Ovid, Namate, thank you for coming on this broadcast. Thank you for the work you're doing. And please come back. It's very important and it's good to talk to you and to learn where ME is at the moment or the research that we hope will bring it to an end. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Thank you for coming. Cheers.